Welcome to this seminar or webinar, as it truly is, uh, which marks the publication of a new DS report on uh, the integration of climate change adaptation and development. It is a great pleasure uh, to have the chance to discuss this important issue with you. Uh, climate change is most likely uh, not be decreasing its uh, importance in the years to come. And so it's crucial to link uh, climate change adaptation and development activities. But this is not always done. And this is precisely what uh, this report tries to do. The report um, is uh, written by four authors from the uh, Danish Institute for International Studies. Um, these four authors are Lili Salum Lindegård, Marie Ladeker Gravesen, Mikkel Futter, and Esben Fritz Hansen and has been uh, commissioned by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And today we have the pleasure of having Mikkel and Espan here, who will kindly introduce uh, the report to us. The report is part of a qu quite some work uh, being undertaken at uh, the Institute on climate change issues in Africa and elsewhere. If you go to dees.dk, uh, you will find references to various publications, most of which are accessible electronically. Uh, the webinar here is organized in the following way. We, if you go down uh, at the bottom of the screen, you will find um, a Q and A box, and you can uh, touch the button there and go in and write your a question or comment uh, during the presentations and then I will try to take uh, this issue with me into the discussion subsequently and um, also if you please could go into the chat room also at the bottom of the screen you could just write one or two uh, lines about yourself presenting yourself so that we have an idea of which kind of community we are forming during this uh, webinar yeah, once again, warm welcome and uh, very happy to have you here. And uh, the presenters, uh, Mikkel and Espon, will give approximately 12, 15 minutes each to present their, their, the report. And then subsequently, we will have a discussion. With these words, the floor is yours, Mikkel. Right. Thanks very much, Lars, and uh, welcome also from me to everyone here on this webinar. We are really looking forward to having a, a good chat here about uh, integrating adaptation and development and telling you a little bit about uh, our new report. Um, and uh, I think uh, just to briefly introduce the idea behind the, the report, um, uh, there's a lot of very important and valid debate about climate financing uh, and the politics of climate financing and the importance of transparency uh, among development uh, corporation donors and other donors and climate funds in, in keeping it quite clear um, how much is provided in terms of climate financing. What we would like to do with this report is to also um, reinvigorate the debate, the more sort of technical debate on the integration and links between adaptation and development and really try to also push from that side to get uh, adaptation and development truly integrated. Um, and uh, we use the term integrated um, uh, in preference to mainstreaming here. Um, I guess you could argue uh, that they are the same thing, but, but we sort of feel that this is, this is more than just bringing adaptation into something that's already going on. This is about really trying to combine into, uh, uh, adaptation and development in, in uh, sort of holistic efforts. So that's why in the report we have, we have tried to use integration where it, uh, where it makes sense. And uh, I will now uh, just uh, start a little presentation here. If I can share my screen, I'm hoping you can all see it. Here we go. And um, what's going to happen now is that I will briefly uh, tell you a little bit about uh, um, sort of the, the, some of the main findings that we have done here in terms of what uh, different development uh, donors are doing, because that is uh, our perspective here on adaptation. Um, and then uh, after that, uh, Espen will talk a, a bit about sort of the particular Danish perspective um, and, and uh, uh, our analysis of what Denmark has done um, 
in recent years and uh, provide some recommendations for where we think uh, Denmark can go and hopefully that is also of interest to a broader audience. Um, of course, we all know that there has been more attention to uh, climate change in recent years, but um, we are currently still on course to uh, moving beyond the Paris Agreement 1.5 and 2 degree goals. Um, and that means that mitigation is, of course, more critical than ever. Um, absolutely no doubt about that, but so is adaptation. We have to learn to live with the changes in the climate that we have initiated and that are going on and which are, of course, especially impacting the most poor and the most vulnerable um, in the global south uh, and in other countries, by the way. Um, this is not a new discussion. For the past 10, 15 years, uh, uh, at least in academia, there has been debates about how do we integrate adaptation and development in, in development cooperation. Uh, it hasn't happened to the extent that we would like to see. Um, and we think there are various reasons for that. One is that we, we think there has been a lack of clear policy signals saying, this is what is important. This is something that we should really pay attention to. Adaptation is important to support. Um, we also uh, feel that there is a tendency maybe to see adaptation as a kind of a, a subsector, something that is you know, being done on its own by certain specialists, um, rather than something that is actually a critical part of, uh, of development uh, and a very important basis for development uh, these days. And then there is also the concern uh, that, that we register with, with some donors that they're worried that if they mix together uh, adaptation and development uh, uh, interventions and policies, then they will be subject to the critique that they are not being sufficiently transparent, that maybe they are doing double accounting with the funds or something like that. Again, a very important debate, um, but, but we feel that it has maybe a little bit stolen the picture uh, from the technical debate on uh, uh, integrating adaptation and development. Uh, and we feel that that is important to continue with. Because adaptation is cross-cutting. Um, it is, of course, about uh, um, disasters and uh, uh, displacement, but it's also about sort of more traditional core development sectors from the old days, infrastructure development, small-scale enterprise development, uh, exporting crops and, and what have you. It's about urban development, it's about trade, it's about jobs, it's about security. So in our perspective, it cuts across all these sectors. One of the things we have done in our report is then to look at how are other development partners, selected development partners, actually approaching adaptation. Um, we have looked at, you can see the, uh, on the right-hand side there, some of the, the donors and some of the countries that we have been looking at. Um, and we have looked especially at how is adaptation being addressed in policies and strategies of, of uh, these partners? How is it being addressed in programming and design and in tracking and reporting? There hasn't been much focus on implementation and on learning. Um, and in the implementation part especially is something that we will continue looking at in our, in our studies as we move ahead. Um, I'll talk especially now uh, just about policies and strategies and programming and design uh, because we feel that this is something where we, we need uh, especially more attention. Um, very, very briefly, uh, uh, there has been a move, we think, from a, a previous situation where uh, funders of, of uh, adaptation were seen sort of either as being very climate specific funders or very development specific funders. Um, and, and there is now, we feel a growing consensus. We can see that in interviews, in reports, in policies and so on. Um, there is an understanding of a need to link adaptation and development. This is very positive. And we actually especially see it with the multilateral development banks. Um, there is often a lot of attention to and focus to the, the multilateral climate funds absolutely key, of course, but the MDBs are very big players also in terms of funding adaptation and, and uh, they're worth keeping an eye on um, in that respect uh, for various reasons. Um, so there is a momentum, but there is also, of course, still different approaches, different uh, 
uh, ways of thinking about this. One of the issues is basically, so who should actually be doing what with which funds? For example, there are people in the GCF who might say that, well, you know, we are funding adaptation and we think that adaptation and development is integrated, but um, the development part of, of the funding should be coming from elsewhere. We are focusing on the adaptation approach. Other uh, donors and funds might uh, think sort of we can, we can fund a little bit of everything um, or across the spectrum. So there is still that uh, uh, discussion. Then we think there is, especially in the bilateral agencies, a certain lack of very clear strategies, not everywhere, but, but in many places, um, about how we're actually going to deal with adaptation. And then we see very different capacities also among the donors. Um, some, uh, uh, like the World Bank, have a pretty substantial capacity now. Others, like some bilateral donors, uh, also Danina, are actually really running very fast to try and address these issues with not enough staff. Um, so, so there is also that, that uh, uh, difference between the different donors. Um, so in terms of policies and strategies more generally, we see there is an opportunity to, 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 uh, to move ahead for, for, for partners to join up and uh, to grab this momentum that there is at the moment in terms of, of realizing that adaptation and development uh, is, is uh, very closely related. Um, and then we think that there are, there is a need to, to address sort of more specifically in terms of policies and strategies. So how are we actually going to address adaptation? How does it link to resilience and, and so on? Looking at programming and design, what we saw, um, and, and many in the audience will maybe recognize this, is that there were actually initial efforts, even 10 to 12 to more years ago, on trying to sort of address climate change in, in program preparations through climate screening, as it, it was and is often called. Mm -hmm. um, but it tended often to be focused on, so uh, this project that we are developing now on agriculture, for example, how might that be um, impacted by climate change? Rather than the other way around, where you say, how can this program help support adaptation and resilience among this climate vulnerable community, for example. And we have seen also a tendency for, 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 for the uh, sort of initial efforts to become tick box exercises and perhaps not really fully institutionalized across the, the sectors. Um, so here we would say um, there's a need now to try and, and incorporate climate change from the outset of programming. Uh, so that you actually build the whole analysis of how this project or this program addresses climate risks and vulnerability into the very first step so that you, you, you simply think it as a very imp important part of, of the whole analysis of the situation. Um, how does this project address vulnerability and climate vulnerability from the outset? And there are options, uh, uh, there, there are three steps approaches as they're called, uh, uh, developed by the MDBs. Some NGOs, including Danish NGOs, are developing this further. DFID have been working on uh, approaches to this. So it's not really necessarily very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to do this or to have, to, it's not something that has to be reinvented. And we think that uh, if there is a more, if it's more clear in, in the programming, how particular uh, interventions actually will support adaptation and climate vulnerability, then it's also easier to sort of make a peace of mind uh, among those who are watching um, that this is actually transparent. This is a project that does actually address adaptation. It says it addresses adaptation and it is addressing adaptation because we can see that here. Lastly, uh, before I hand over to Espen, we think that the programming is, 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 is also in need of maybe more, more consideration of, of the institutional choices that are made uh, in terms of supporting development and adaptation. Uh, this is, is a, an example of a different institutional choices that different donors have made. At the top, we have the World Bank and the, uh, who administer the climate investment funds and an adaptation program called the PPCR in Zambia. We're working with the ministries of planning and finance and with local government. 
the logic there is that you have to work with sort of the big overall important ministries that can make a difference and that can convene. Then we have the UNDP and the GCF also working in Zambia who have tended to work more with the technical ministries, with the environment, with the agriculture, uh, and with an argument that says you can also mainstream too much. You can, you can go, go so, so far away from the, from the sort of the substance of things that you don't actually uh, get anything properly technically uh, satisfying done. And then you have the CARE LP programs who are working with the local government and civil society and other NGOs who are focusing on CBOs. So there are these different institutional choices and I think it's important to, to consider uh, more clearly how, what, what are the strategies of, of, uh, of, of our programs if you are a donor here, both in terms of where, where do you align in, in, the, in the, the government uh, um, mechanisms and in terms of at what levels do you focus. So I think I will stop there um, on, on, on this uh, part of the presentation. And then I was hoping to switch over to uh, Espan, who just returned there. That's great. Okay, yeah. over to you, Espan. Thank you very much. Yes, Espan, uh, you had some difficulties with your presentation just before we started, but have you solved your I have challenges? solved my difficulties, thank you. Yes, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, okay, uh, have you switched over to me, Lars? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Espen, now you should turn your mic off. So please turn it on again. Yes, now you are, I think. Okay, thanks a lot. So, um, thank you, Mikkel. Um, uh, I will then be talking about the second part of our study where we where we focused on Danish uh, official commitment to adaptation from the period 2013 to uh, 2017, uh, where we go a step deeper into the, uh, to the data. Uh, and I'll sh share uh, my screen uh, with you here. Um, uh, so, so we uh, went into, uh, the uh, official database, the database of the foreign ministry, and um, and a colleague, um, Lily, uh, spent a, a month uh, extracting data and resorting it in in an Excel sheet, um, and and uh, and looking at uh, at uh, combining all the 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 projects and whether it is principal or significant. Uh, um, uh, marking uh, uh, based on the Rio, Rio markers, uh, whether it's, it is uh, the uh, major objective of the, uh, of the program is adaptation or whether it's um, uh, significant, win meaning uh, uh, that it's, it's mentioned uh, in, in, in as one of the components, then it's addressed with 50% of the share. Um, just a note, um, uh, uh, we were able to do this in 1617 as it, uh, and it was not uh, marked uh, uh, consistently before 16 and 18 data was not yet available for us. Uh, um, and the significant mark is not necessarily uh, uh, less effort than the principal. It's, it's, uh, it's simply an indicator of successful uh, integration uh, of uh, adaptation concerns. Uh, so what do we find? Um, uh, support for the delivery pathways of the uh, a bit more than a, a billion Danish kroner from 13 to 17. We find that uh, around half of it was challenged through uh, bilateral aid. Uh, uh, around a third through the multilateral uh, organizations and 16% uh, through, through NGOs. Um, and uh, it, it varies a bit, uh, or this is uh, the average over the years, it varies a, a bit uh, between the years. Uh, the, so the share of the NGOs might actually be smaller because it was a very, uh, 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 cross way of, of accounting uh, NGOs in the start of the period. 
and generally uh, the needless uh, uh, marking of adaptation have 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 improved uh, over the years with external uh, 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 accounting as well. Uh, so. If we then uh, distribute this across uh, uh, sectors by delivery pathway, we find that um, the biggest sector is the public institutional framework. And maybe a word on how we did this. Well, this is, uh, this is something we have done uh, looking at the database and then uh, assessing which sector uh, um, uh, the program uh, can be categorized as uh, based on the uh, project uh, summary of project documents or, or so so this is our uh, classification uh, and we find that um, public institutional works is is the major one and then uh, uh, the classical sectors like rural development agriculture water sanitation uh, is 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 high uh, which is which is um, uh, very much linked up to the type of of uh, development assistance from from Danita. multiple sectors uh, uh, is is uh, ngos uh, it's just um, a problem with with the categorization so don't don't look at that maybe a bit more uh, surprising is that the number of uh, of, of sectors which have had a lot of, um, it's been high on, on the political agenda during this period, uh, received very little uh, attention when it comes to, to uh, climate change adaptation. Uh, and one can include uh, uh, migration and displacement uh, as, as little uh, support within climate change, peace building conflicts, private sector. And, 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 and health uh, received more or less uh, no, uh, no integration with cl climate change adaptation, uh, which is somehow surprising. If you look at the same data with, with, uh, with delivery pathways, uh, we find a major difference between how multilateral uh, organizations um, are prioritizing uh, the support for climate change adaptation with, where, where the major uh, uh, public institutional frameworks uh, are, are supported through multilateral while the bilateral support is, is more, uh, uh, more spread over the, the traditional uh, uh, AIDS uh, support sectors, uh, notably ex excluding some. Uh, if I then uh, just sum up um, relating to uh, to the uh, to the recommendations we end up making in the report, uh, uh, we're suggesting uh, based on the analysis which uh, which Mikkel put forward earlier to make climate change a key aim in uh, in Danish development assistance in line with the uh, with the poverty alleviation and, and other aims migration, um, private sector. Uh, and there's a need for, for this in, in order to, uh, to, uh, to put it, uh, it is high on the agenda right now, politically, it's not reflected in, in, in how it's, it's uh, funding is allocated within, within Danita. And there's a real need for developing a, a clear strategy for Danish support uh, for climate change. It's very much ad hoc as, as, as it is today. Uh, so a strategy should both reflect the all strategic framework of development cooperation and more specific strategy, which uh, provide uh, means for steering adaptation support. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Denmark uh, provides support for a number of multilateral organizations without a clear strategy for uh, for uh, in terms of uh, whether these uh, multilateral organizations are in line with Danish policies or not it is uh, there's uh, there's a need for, for for such a strategy and and more clear uh, clear uh, implementation and we 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 say we should factor in adaptation into development across all sectors as 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 Mikkel was talking about um uh 
what we, we are saying not all development is adaptation, but all good adaptation is development. There is an integration and, and we need to, to uh, pay attention to adaptation from the policy uh, programming to the design uh, over to monitoring and, and learning, uh, not uh, an add-on. And, and for this, uh, this will need more human resources devoted to climate change within Danita. This is only possible if there is more resources uh, added to uh, uh, with uh, internal uh, capacity within within Danita. I will stop here and hand back to you, Lars. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, both of you, for fine presentations here of, of some of the points in, in uh, the report, but there are many more. And uh, I hope that we can touch uh, upon some of these uh, in, in the discussion that we start now. Uh, all participants are, of course, most welcome to write comments and questions in the Q&A box, uh, if you would like to do so. And I'll try to take them into the discussion. But let me start off uh, with a, uh, a question uh, to you, Mikkel. Um, you, you mentioned, oh, this is a key point in, in, uh, in your report, namely that, that uh, climate change adaptation needs to be integrated into all development activities, at least conceptually or, or from the beginning. Um, could you provide some examples of what you think of uh, when we talk about uh, sectors like uh, employment or governance, uh, uh, issues like that? How, how should uh, climate change adaptation be uh, integrated in such activities? Um, well, I mean, if, if we're talking about employment, I would say, uh, you know, I would start by saying, so how does, how does climate change here impact the livelihoods and the vulnerabilities of, of the, a given country, a, a given area, a given setting? And, uh, and what are the people's adaptation strategies? And uh, not just in, in, among farmers in rural areas, but, but also in urban settings and so on. And then looking at, so how can uh, our efforts to support uh, jobs and employment support that? How can they contribute to that? Right. So people will will often, uh, as in many other cases, they'll they'll resort to diversification, diversifying their their sources of income when when they are hit by climate change. Right. Can we uh, help develop a, a particular part of the sector or the economy that can support that? That can support their existing adaptation strategies. Um, is there maybe a, a, an unfortunate process of climate change displacement going on? where people are being pushed away from the fields that they normally farm or, or from their uh, other, other places that they inhabit? Is there an opportunity to provide them with sources of income through particular uh, uh, new jobs or whatever? Um, or if, if we're talking about agriculture, is there an opportunity to develop um, uh, new sectors of the agricultural sector that can uh, uh, include jobs or, and help promote exports, whatever? So, is that for me is an example of how you would rather than saying uh, you know the other way around that we, we are going to be doing some jobs in this sector maybe it uh, supports adaptation we don't we don't know um, I'd start the other place in terms of governance um, big issue uh, I, I think I think we I think there is a need for everywhere in the world actually um, that that we think adaptation more in terms of governance in terms of having discussions, conversations about what kind of adaptation do we need here? So, so democratic, inclusive debates about what is good adaptation in this context. Um, rather than saying, you know, from a technical point of view, um, it might be good to, uh, to do this or that here, to build this dam or uh, increase this road in this way. How do we want to spend our adaptation funds and what do we want to spend them on? because there is not agreement on that, uh, because people have different livelihoods, different preferences. So developing those democratic mechanisms, um, not, not new ones, I'd hope, but, uh, but integrating them in the existing ones and looking at what are the right levels of governance to discuss that at, um, nationally, local governments, community level, and so on. And then, of course, governance also has to do with the uh, rights, with access to and control of resources. And uh, if you are a pastoralist who wants to adapt by changing the course of your normal cyclical mobility ac around, uh, across the year, 
you may need to go to new places or you may need to go to your old grazing grounds that have now been occupied by others. So access to water uh, and land and, and how is that governed? So these issues, I think, need to be taken much more into consideration in these different uh, programs that are being supported right now. Yeah. Uh, yes, Espen. Uh, just a moment, because there are interesting questions to, to you and to the, the analysis of the Danish uh, uh, adaptation um, experiences. So I'll turn to that in a moment. But before that, I'd, I'd just like to follow up, uh, Megan, with you and ask, because as a Clearly, it is a key point in your report that this integration has to take place. But don't you see costs? Uh, as in normally, it has been an argument that, that uh, it is uh, a little bit dangerous, or we would like to take uh, uh, climate change finance, uh, financing of climate change activities uh, as something additional to development activities. If we start, start uh, integrating the two, then it becomes completely uh, empty less with that argument. So, so don't you see uh, costs of, of this integration? Um, I, I, not really, actually. I mean, the, the, the focus on ensuring transparency should still be there um, uh, and, and is very important, but it should just not obstruct or, or, or hinder the integration of the two, of adaptation and development. And so, so I actually see more, um, to be a little bit provocative, I see more, co more, more potential costs of of keeping the two apart, right? Of ring fencing, adaptation funding, in, in particular um, uh, pools and funds, uh, because then they, they can become very sort of adaptation specific and not become integrated in, in development more broadly. Um, so so uh, as long as there is a continued emphasis on, on uh, ensuring that, that there is transparency in, in how much is provided and is it provided to to what we say it's provided to, um, then I don't see many costs of integrating. I only really see benefits. Okay. Espen, you would like to comment? Um, yes, it, it was uh, on the governance before. I think it's um, governance is also important uh, for who's setting, who's setting the priority of using the finance for, for adaptation. I think there is, there is uh, uh, the governance is highly skewed towards uh, centralization in 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 in, uh, in in where finance is 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 used uh, uh, most of the funding uh, is used uh, in, in as overheads and uh, in in urban centers very little trigger trigger all the way uh, down and that's a that's a a whole drive in in the recent years towards ensuring uh uh, at the more uh, devolved, inclusive uh, governance of, of uh, climate change uh, uh, finance, because uh, you need to take uh, it's 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 dangerous to take the decisions or uh, or adaptation too far away from from those involved in the, in, in the actual okay. process. Okay. Uh, it has implications for. Uh, for governance in that sense. Yeah. And, and, and in, in, in the other question you talked about, uh, the, 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 the mainstreaming, it, it is, uh, adaptation is really a long-term issue, often much longer than, than the, uh, than the uh, development program. Uh, and there's a need to, uh, uh, therefore there's a need to integrate the two. It's also a moving target. It's, uh, it, it needs constantly uh, uh, updating and, and adaptation mm. to the analysis. So, so what we are arguing is an integration whereby development and adaptation uh, aims um, are integrated in a comprehensive manner and certainly not the type of, of, uh, of mainstreaming as we've seen in, in, in for example, gender. Yeah, now we jumped a little bit, uh, yeah. but we may come back to that in a moment. There is a mm -hmm. question also uh, from the audience about uh, tourism. Could you make examples of, of, of how to integrate adaptation thinking into uh, work within the tourist uh, sector? Mm. Uh, it's, um, yeah. Well, I'm... Um, I, I guess it's again uh, you have to to look at the at the context and 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 make the analysis of how 
how is uh, is climate change hazards uh, within a given area affecting uh, affecting uh, uh, people and and how 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 can you uh, adapt to these uh, vulnerabilities uh, uh, but whether it, uh, how it links to tourism i'm i'm, I'm uh, yeah, i think uh, I, I, I think i think there are there are also issues of of uh, of rights in terms of tourism um, you know let, let's take something like resorts along the coast who are actually uh, uh, in many places now beginning to protect their resorts against um, rising sea levels and they they uh, fence off areas and they take sand from other places and so on um, that's a very specific case right but but I think I think a lot of the issue, the, the sort of fundamental issues of uh, of uh, uh, tourism and and the relationships to uh, to uh, local economies and and communities are very relevant in in this respect as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, okay. I, I think there's something interesting to explore there actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's fine that you can't answer on all sectors <laughs> like that. But uh, then there's a question uh, regarding. Um, whether a further integration of adaptation into development projects hinder efforts to mobilize new and additional climate finance due to double accounting. Um, do you see so that, that that could be another cost of, of a further integration, namely that, that it becomes more difficult to mobilize funds uh, for climate change? I, I, I think it's really time to um, to uh, distinctly sharply between finance and implementation yeah. uh, it uh, there, there, there is a need for for integrating in uh, development and, and 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 adaptation to improve the quality of of the adaptive uh, action and and i think it's it, it's been quite harmful to to mix up uh the concern over double uh, accounting with with the implementation process. Uh, surely, that it 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 is a concern which is uh, which is valid that that uh, that the Western world forget their promises to the in, to the uh, Paris Agreement. However, um, uh, it's time to move ahead, and and it has been it has been harmful then to only focus on ad adaptation without thinking uh, thinking in development uh, uh, okay. cooperation I, uh, as long as you keep keep the financial parts uh, and mobilization of of funds uh, separate from from uh, from the development i say I, I i see uh, no problem in in in, in integrating the two. Then the question is of course uh, whether it is possible to distinguish clearly between mm -hmm. financing and concrete activities. But let's turn a little bit to the, uh, your analysis of the Danish uh, experience and the Danish uh, uh, data, uh, because there are some interesting uh, questions here. Uh, mm. Just first uh, one for clarification. Uh, these data, are they uh, from the climate envelope or do they include other um, relevant support uh, from sector programs and so on? It's, it's across the board, isn't it? Yes. Yes. It's, so it's not just the climate. Uh, no. in the, and, okay. and if you um, if you look into the DS report, w which you can download, you you can see uh, uh, we have a table there showing how much uh, uh, support uh, from from the climate uh, envelope and how much comes uh, through through uh, bilateral aid and, and multilateral aid and NGOs. There's okay. there's a, a distinction of the data in the in the in the in the report. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, then uh, I think uh, what now I cannot really find the question, but that was okay. Uh, on another line with respect to, to the, the findings um, from the your analysis of the Danish data, um, you say it is a very much an ad hoc prioritization of funds. Um, could you clarify a little bit more in detail what what determines this ad hoc uh, prioritization? Why is it sometimes something and sometimes something different uh, that is 
the focus of adaptation uh, activities. Do you have any idea of that? Well, well, I mean, for my part, I think it's um, it's probably driven by proposals coming in that uh, uh, because there is no clear strategy, um, you get a proposal on this and a proposal on that. Mm. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're, we're saying let's do some more joined up thinking about uh, uh, how we want to integrate this and, and uh, how we can, can ensure that it's, uh, it's, it's not, I mean, ad hoc can be good, yeah? <laughs> um, it's not that everything should be shut down but, but, um, and, and sort of put in a straitjacket, but, but uh, I mean, I think it is good to have some more sort of holistic thinking on what are we actually going to do, be doing with this. Mm. So I, 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 think, uh, I think it would be good to have a strategy on it. And, and, and I guess it's also that, that there is, uh, there's not uh, a lot of uh, human resources within the ministry to, to uh, carry out the analysis of uh, what, what, what do Denmark want with its money? Uh, with, the, with this billion uh, kroner we've used, uh, do we want uh, to invest in the health sector? Do we want to help invest in, 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 uh, in um, in institutional frameworks, it's it is uh, uh, it's it's like you've financed various uh, projects, but but there's no um, overall strategy behind wh how, how which sector is prioritized or 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 others. Uh, and uh, and also, if you look at the multilateral organizations, and Denmark have maybe supported a, a dozen or more of of these uh, climate funds they operate very differently. And I don't think anybody has an overview of uh, which one is better than others. And uh, Danita do not have an opinion about uh, which we support, should support over, over others. So there's a, there's a, that's why we say ad hoc in a, maybe in a provocative way. I guess yeah. there's also been a flow of uh, political signals over this period while, while uh, well, the recent, uh, the current government is is uh, has put uh, climate change uh, uh, adaptation uh, high on the agenda. It 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 uh, lived a, a more quiet life uh, with the previous uh, government. So, so that is. So the reason for for the lack of a strategy until now may be political or what? Um, I, I couldn't say. Okay, <laughs> you you haven't come across uh, an explanation of why. Well, hasn't been a strategy so far. I mean, I, I, I guess there's been, uh, we've come across uh, that there's the attention to climate change have, have uh, clearly gone down over the years. And, uh, and, and right now there's uh, increased attention hmm. to climate okay. change adaptation uh, within the ministry. That's fair yeah. to say. Okay, maybe? Uh, no, I think Espen has, uh, has said it, yeah? Okay, yeah. Yeah, man, thanks, Lola. Um, yeah, then, then there was this um, uh, issue which you just touched upon, uh, Espan, namely uh, you, you suggest them kind of mainstreaming. If we want to make this integration, um, then, then an obvious answer is that we, we should mainstream. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you also hinted, the experience is not very good. Uh, in terms of uh, gender mainstreaming, which has been an issue that that has actually been at the top of the agenda for, for many, many years. So uh, why do you expect that uh, this will be different? Why will it be possible to mainstream climate adaptation much more strongly into all different kinds of, of activities uh, when it hasn't been, uh, and there has been a lot of support for gender equality in, in many years. So, so is there any qualitative difference here? Um, I, I, in, in the, um, Michael, did you want? I, I, yes. We looked a bit in the experience of, of other uh, donor agencies and, and we've seen in the UK, uh, they have tried to uh, and 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 failed to main uh, mainstream it. The, the action have been under quite uh, some criticism in terms of uh, of mainstreaming in the UK. While we've seen, if you look, look towards the the World Bank, I think they they made a more wholehearted effort to uh, to uh, 
go away from adaptation as an incremental course towards a more uh, systemic uh, approach uh, to to the integration. They they are perhaps one of the leading organizations in, in this today. Hmm. So it's a, it 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 requires an, a strategy and and a political will from from uh, from the top of the ministry, hmm. and and politically of course. Uh, uh, but uh, but it's it will become necessary because there's uh, uh, if not uh, the 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 problems with climate change adaptation will will undermine uh, the effectiveness of of, of development assistance uh, mm. if it's not done. Yeah, and I think also I mean it's it's also about how you do mainstreaming, right? So I think one of the the points of criticism on the on the uh, the earlier sort of efforts at, at mainstreaming in the UK was was that it was sort of it was an add-on, right? So it was it was an attempt to green some activities in exactly the way that we are we are suggesting it shouldn't be done, uh, rather than going down and saying from the outset, uh, as I as I believe is increasingly happening now um, how, in the UK. How, how do we actually, how do we conceive this whole program? How do we think uh, and how do we analyze uh, climate change into this and adaptation into this, as I explained earlier on? Hmm. Um, and, and, th and, and that is for me critical for it to happen. Uh, so so it's, it's no good to just uh, make tick boxes. It, it has to be truly integrated into the way that, you know, into the, into the way that it's, things are planned, but also into the, the quality assurance and into the, the policy level decision making and approval of particular programs. Huh. Uh, and that does require that it really is taken seriously. Um, and rather than something we also have to remember. Okay. Another thing you do in the report is to emphasize the need for an um, initial analysis of what are the adaptation needs and potentials in a particular area. And and then uh, uh, development activities should be organized accordingly. Um, as one uh, have asked, uh, this is perhaps a little bit in, in contradiction to the current focus on results, all the time documenting results everywhere and uh, adaptation may be a little bit difficult uh, yeah, I don't know, to, it, it may be somewhat indirect uh, that, that uh, you can uh, document results, but also it may be a little bit in, in contradiction to the current concern with, with um, learning from development activities, doing development differently, as it is called sometimes, uh, namely that you always have to adapt act activities, uh, um, if I may use that word, uh, to the current uh, context and, and changes taking place. So, so there's a lot of emphasis currently on, on precisely that moment rather than the initial analysis. Do you see a contradiction there? Uh, yeah, who should I ask? Mikkel? Yes, thank you. I mean, I like the, the, uh, the idea of moving towards greater, uh, a more flexible, iterative approach to, to, to programming and less log frame straight jackets and more in, emphasis on implementation and learning. What's not to like about that? But, but what I would hope is that it doesn't become an excuse to say, so we don't really need um, people who, who, who know particular uh, technical issues or that it becomes an excuse to be less rigorous in identifying the problems um, that you are trying to address and the, the aims and the goals that you're actually working towards. That would, be, that would make me very worried. So, so um, I, I don't see the, uh, the, uh, the opposition of those two things. Um, and I think anybody who who has studied adaptation will understand that you do need also in implementation a sort of a flexible ab approach because these things shift and change all the time. But it's this whole basic thing of thinking it in from the outset and what are the vulnerabilities here and how are we helping to address it in this particular program. Um, I don't think that's a contradiction with, uh, with a more sort of focus on implementation learning flexible implementation. Okay, so it has been too much add-on until now, and, and you, you want to emphasize the initial analysis to, to organize the activity in a reasonable way. Yes, I mean, analysis sounds very academic, but, but it is, it is a, it's, it's the exercise of identifying what are the problems we want to address here, hmm. which of course is a, um, 
an inclusive process and and uh, and uh, should very importantly be done with the uh, the partners and the recipient governments and uh, and uh, local governments and communities yeah. and espen espen you have uh, emphasized that this can only be done with a lot of uh, professional uh, staff uh, in the leader and elsewhere uh, working on on this it is necessary with knowledge and and uh, proper approach to these things, uh, knowing about the prop development problems and so on. But you also note in, in uh, your report that, that uh, the multilateral development banks have come far, uh, that uh, NGOs have come far in this uh, field. So one could ask, uh, why does a development agency like Danita have to uh, have these capacities? Uh, do they, couldn't they just leave, uh, send the money to, to those who know about the things and then leave the work to them? Mm. Um, thank you. Um, I, I don't think we need a lot of uh, professional staff. We need some staff. We, we, need, we need some basic staff. It's, it's, it's really, uh, 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 to, to make to have good development assistance and include this analysis of vulnerability you you need uh, uh, people who who can who can who can contribute to that and i think um, i think uh, in order for Danita to to have a, a, a coherent strategy they they of course also need to uh, to get involved uh, with it themselves and not uh, not an, an we are talking about integrating it we are not talking about having a separate uh, because they're good at it in a bank we send the money there but there should be perhaps staff in Danita who can learn from what's happening in the bank mm -hmm. and 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 can 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 uh, can uh, can can uh, make uh, these conscious choices and 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 uh, assist in integrating climate change into. Right now, it's around fifty percent of our adaptation, which uh, which is bilateral, and and uh, a third goes to uh, to uh, uh, to multilateral. And and uh, we are not arguing to change this uh, this this uh, this balance. Um, uh, but there is a need to to send money to those who do a good job and and less to those who who are, who are not doing a good job and that we need to it's interesting that the, as the Danita evaluation we are evaluating Danish assistance and there's a, currently a, an evaluation of of a, a Danish support for adaptation which will be out here in the in, in, within the next six months I believe. But uh, we have ne very little idea uh, about the funding we send to multilateral organizations because that is uh, being evaluated by by them. There is there is a there is a need to have a better understanding of of uh, where we uh, which organization we we say we support for climate change adaptation. But I don't see a, a need for, for to just leave it to others. In, in fact, there is a need to uh, to learn from others and and do it do it ourselves. There's another question, namely whether you see a contradiction or a conflict between funds for mitigation and that adaptation. So you have emphasized the importance of adaptation, but do you see a conflict there uh, between the two initiatives in, in development cooperation? Uh, Michael? I mean, I think the principle of, uh, of having a 50 50 uh, allocation of mitigation and adaptation. Funding, such as is also the case in the GCF, for example, is a, is is a pretty good one. Um, I see a contradiction in the in the in the sense that some countries may have particular uh, interests in uh, in uh, in particular directions. We are uh, um, exporting important uh, wind technology, which contributes to mitigation from Denmark. Absolutely great and brilliant. But um, that should not mean then that our policies, policies are only for focused on uh, mitigation uh, uh, because adaptation is also very important for us to, 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 uh, to focus on. Um, so I think, uh, I mean, if we can, we can stick with the 50-50, I think that's, uh, that's pretty good. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, just to throw a spanner into the equation, uh, um, uh, not all adaptation has uh, cost money. 
uh, uh, there is not a direct relationship on how much money we spend on adaptation and how much uh, ad adaptation outcome. There is, there is quite a, a few areas within adaptation which is more a question of doing things different. And thereby, uh, and uh, which is also why we need uh, more uh, human resources and, and, uh, and analysis, because the, the, the much of adaptation is about governance and governing it uh, in a more sustainable manner, you know, natural resources, for example. Uh, and it does not necessarily mean a, a lot of resources. Of course, there's some areas like like infrastructure development, uh, which which is. Uh, quite heavy in investments for, for adaptation, but other areas are not. And the current way we are, um, are monitoring, uh, registering our support for adaptation uh, only looks at the funding allocated rather than, than, the, than, the, um, the, than the actually adaptation action. Hmm. Okay. Uh, there's another question regarding uh, climate change adaptation and uh, or climate change and conflict. Hmm. And uh, I'd like to ask you, maybe because I know that you have views on this, uh, namely that um, do you see, for instance, peace building as an important part of climate change adaptation? Uh, since there is this view that, that uh, conflict can multiply, uh, or, or uh, rather climate change can multiply conflicts and, and create uh, difficulties for many people. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean in terms of, of peace building, I think, um, I, th I think it's important to to you know appreciate that that the the the, the act of managing resources uh, and uh, can actually be a, a sort of um, a means of of post conflict um, uh, 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 sort of development in, in because you begin to bring people together around managing land and water and I think that that UNEP for example have had some interesting. Uh, uh, efforts in that direction. Um, I think that, that uh, it's important also to realize though that, that uh, there is not always a direct causal relationship between climate change and conflict. Um, it can contribute to conflict, no doubt about it, but it can also, uh, uh, as we have seen in some of our studies in, in, uh, in, uh, on, on water governance and water management, that these it can also contribute to increasing collaboration uh, because when there is a scarce resource, people will work together. Um, so I think it's certainly something that uh, that needs to be worked on and addressed, and can be incorporated in uh, in conflict resolution work and peace building work. Um, as long as we are aware of of these uh, problems in establishing sort of very direct links, so we, it's not enough to just say now we will solve climate change and the conflicts will go away. Okay. Um, Time is running out. We have one minute left, uh, and I would like to end on with this question uh, for you, Espan, um, because uh, you presented your recommendations, and um, those recommendations are what, yeah, what one could actually expect to some extent. Namely, that there's a need for strategy, there's a need for a great general objective. Uh, there should be mainstreaming and develop specific guidelines in the field of adaptation and so on. Uh, and I wonder uh, if as I, it seems that you really want to rock the boat. Uh, you want to change development cooperation in this field. So what about uh, doing something more drastic? What about creating a separate agency or for, as a, for climate change adaptation or uh, channeling significant amounts of money for specialized multilateral institutions? That, this is not what you recommend. Why? No, it's not. Uh, we, we are recommending uh, an, an, an integration uh, which, which, uh, which allow adaptation to be integrated in, 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 in the whole development program, making more conscious choices and, and uh, develop this uh, cap capacity to, 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 to steer the uh, development assistance. We do not uh, recommend uh, recommend uh, uh, separating adaptation from from development uh, and i think um, i think the experience with uh, with with uh, sending um, funding these specialized uh, agencies for adaptation is is 
is not particularly good in the sense that they, some of them at least have, have tended to separate adaptation from, from development. I think, uh, I think uh, there is a potential uh, in, in Denmark uh, with, with the current government to take a lead in, in, in this uh, within Danida. Um, I, I don't, maybe we haven't thought enough out of the box, <laughs> but, but I, uh, a certain, I don't see a, a, I see a need to, to more integrate it in the entire uh, work with, with a better staff. And I don't see, um, see a need to, to create a certainly uh, a totally different entity. Okay. Uh, but there's a, a lot of need for learning. I think the Danish NGOs are also quite active in this area and, and innovative, and there's a need for, for, for learning across, across the spectrum of, of delivery, delivery pathways. Yeah, okay. Thank you. With this optimistic note on political leadership in Denmark, <laughs> we will end this uh, webinar. Thank you for listening and, and joining the discussion.